Welcome to this new episode of Eklund Education. My name is Ryan Coyman. I'm the Director of Training with Napa Eklund and Napa Temp and want to welcome you all here. Today I'm standing in a shop, an auto care center in Allendale, Michigan. This is a shop where I actually spent about the first or actually last 10 years of my career as a technician and today I'll also introduce you to Chris Youngsma, one of our training developers. He spent some time here as well. Kind of a unique opportunity because there's actually a Napa store on the other side behind the camera here and so it's a very unique uh, facility here. But you can tell there's a lot of work going on here even though it's lunchtime. We've got quick lube, tires, other technicians trying to get stuff done. So in a minute we're going to slide over to my personal little uh, shop. But moving forward we're going to be doing a lot of these uh, educational pieces from our corporate training center in Irving, Texas. And we've got our studio there, we've got a shop built up there, we've got a lot of uh, test equipment. And so we're gonna be doing a lot of these from that facility. But to kick this off, I wanna do it from this auto care center, be relatable with, with you all as the audience. Speaking of our training center, I wanna invite you to come down for a hands-on class. We're gonna draw 10 people from these sessions uh, at the end of the year, and we're gonna host a unique uh, class just for them. And so this is gonna be an all expense paid trip down to the DFW airport. Uh, we'll cover the air, airfare. We're gonna pick you up there. We're gonna cover the hotel for two nights. This is a 50-50 uh, hands-on versus classroom style class there. And just a, a lot of good time there, a lot of good camaraderie with the trainers as well as with other students. So how do you get signed up for that again? Well, now's the time to open up the Q&A box there and go ahead and enter in your first name, your last name, the name of your shop, as well as the city and state that your shop is in and give us a good email address. That's how we're gonna communicate with you if you are the winner and we wanna know. We'll pull the registration list here, but quite often, you know, like even at the shop here, there's a group of guys sitting in the break room right now and it's registered under one person's name. We wanna make sure that all of you in attendance today get an opportunity to sign up and win this trip. So go ahead, enter in your information there. But that being said, we're gonna continue on here, but let's, uh, let's kind of step away from the busyness of shop. My personal area is right behind here. So let's quick go to commercial break and learn a little bit more about our Eklund ignition coils. And then we're gonna pick back up again with Chris in the shop. What's in your box? If you're replacing an ignition coil, it's probably because the original one failed. Napa Eklund import ignition coils include numerous improvements over the OE design. So you can be confident the job will be done right the first time. Our Napa Eklund engineers looked at how and why OE coils fail and made specific upgrades to address common weak points. Prolonged exposure to high temperature is a common reason for coil failure, so many of our improvements focus on reducing heat and improving insulation. Napa Eklund import coils feature a flexible, high-temperature resistant silicone boot and high dielectric strength housing to withstand extreme heat and provide superior insulation. The advanced thermosynthetic coil connector ensures a proper connection and resists fractures caused by heat and thermal cycling. The internal core of a Napa Eklund import coil is made from grain-oriented electrical steel. This improves the magnetic circuit and allows the coil to operate at lower temperatures while improving performance. The precision wound bobbin includes additional sections and simplified core separators, which compensate for thermal expansion inside the coil. Let's take a closer look at the popular Nissan 3.5 liter V6 coil. A typical system produces up to 30 kilovolts, the original coil with eight sections has to push nearly four kilovolts through each section. Napa Eklund adds a section to require only 3.3 kilovolts through each. More sections means less heat, and less heat means a longer coil life. These Napa Eklund coils outperform the OE, producing more spark energy and longer lasting discharge for improved vehicle performance, fuel economy, and emissions. Another common cause of coil failure is moisture and corrosion. Napa Eklund import coils address both. High dielectric epoxy is injected into the case in a vacuum to eliminate air pockets and prevent moisture intrusion. Our popular IC629 features an improved one-piece design to further guard against moisture intrusion. 
Add an upgraded brass mounting bushing and stainless steel spring to reduce corrosion, and you've got a precision coil. By specifically addressing common failure points and improving on the original design, Napa Eklund delivers a more reliable, better performing, and longer lasting import ignition coil. All right, hey, we're away from the, the busyness of the shop over here in my own little area now, uh, much quieter, and so we've got some stuff kind of set up here. But so sticking with our topic today, talking about ignition coils and also cam and crank, the two really go hand in hand. We need that good, accurate signal from the cam and crank sensors to accurately fire the ignition system. So we've got our old favorite tools. You know, we got this, the spark testers, no matter what type of flavor you've got. Our scan tool is still gonna be one of our primary diagnostic tools, especially when it comes to cam and crank sensors. You know, we're gonna be looking at correlation. Uh, on today's modern vehicles, when we're talking about VVT, we need to ensure the accuracy of the sensor to report how the VVT system is working. And one great tip for everybody, and hopefully you already know this, but anytime you're touching a cam or crank sensor or doing something with a harmonic balancer or even something with a torque converter or the clutch on the backside of the crankshaft, we need to do a crank relearn procedure. Now, different vehicles have different procedures. Some of them you're going to run it in the bay. Some you're going to do with a scan tool. Some you're going to have to take a, a drive down the road. Some vehicles might even call it a misfire profile identification procedure. But it's important to always look up the information and service information to understand how to do it on the vehicle you're working on. If you don't do it, now misfire counters might be inhibited or even worse, they might be inaccurate. So do yourself and the rest of the technician uh, world a favor and do that relearn procedure afterwards. So I've got Chris Youngsma with me here today. Chris is one of our training developers and he's gonna dive much further into the specifics of diagnosing an ignition coil, as well as cam and crank and how they all come work together for their accuracy. Chris, take it away. Thank you for the intro, Ryan. And we're gonna dive into some of these ignition systems now, and also looking at why cam and crank sensors are so important to these systems as well. Some of the things we'll be covering, hopefully during the session for you, will be the different ignition components that are involved in the ignition system, uh, types of control, how we're actually making these events happen, wiring diagrams, we'll analyze how uh, the control is actually making its way to the component itself, and we're also going to be doing kind of our own case study on the vehicle, applying some of these techniques with what we're uh, looking at on the diagrams, and utilizing a lab scope to analyze uh, these systems as well. As far as the ignition components go for these systems, uh, one of the main components is obviously going to be ignition coils such as we've got on the bench here. So we've got sometimes coil packs or we have a coil on plug or coil near plug as well. And it depends on the make of the vehicle and also the year of the vehicle. Now with these coils though, we're going to have a different control depending on how the coil is built. So this is where a lot of our variance is going to be in between the systems. If we take a look at one of our most common ignition coils, it's going to be a Ford two wire ignition coil. This is going to be something that probably most technicians have replaced out in the field before. And really it's a rather simple uh, process as to how this event happens and you have a main common power feed to the coil, and then the PCM is going to be in control of this coil itself. And this is also going to be why we have such high failure rates with these coils too. So if we're gonna break down this two wire coil a little bit further, uh, if we look at these internals of it, we will generally see the primary and secondary windings inside a permanent magnet, an isolator, and most all of the ignition coils are gonna have a similar layout for the coil boot as shown in the slide. So we've got the coil boot here. Sometimes we've got rubber only and other times we may have kind of like a plastic mold to it as well. The two wire ignition coil is often the easiest to test with a lab scope too. So this is something good to keep in mind where if we wanna utilize a paddle probe or anything like that to see our ignition waveform, this is easily done oftentimes with a two wire coil 
as we don't have a module on top of the coil. And a lot of these are a little bit more easily accessible. However, some of the V-style engines like a V6 Ford uh, can be a little more difficult access in the back. So performing voltage and current testing with these coils is often really easy and accessible uh, compared to other coil designs. Now, if we move on from a two-wire coil design, we are looking at three-wire ignition coils. We can see now that the ignition coils in these pictures here, we have a General Motors one on the left and a Honda Acura coil on the right. And we have a module internal to these coils now. So with a three-wire coil, we're no longer just utilizing the PCM for control of this coil we are actually using a module on the coil as well. And this is going to be a little bit different wiring layout, as well as what we're going to be seeing if we want to analyze this with a lab scope too. So if we take a closer look at the internals of this compared to the two wire coil, we can see what we were talking about there with the uh, module actually being internal. It's really easy to see on the General Motors coil where we've got it on top of the coil and it's really easily uh, viewable and it's a common coil that we've had to replace probably in the field as well. Now this Honda coil, this has a module as well. However, it's internal and you can't really see it because the molding on top of the coil is covering that module. Uh, the method of controlling though is going to vary from how we had the two wire coil. So like I said, the ECM before was in complete control of the coil and we just had a power feed. Now we're going to have a power, a ground, and we're going to have some type of a control from the PCM to the module, and the module is going to be dictating some of the functionality of the coil as well. Now, if we take a look at that Ford um, or Chrysler PCM, anything like that that's running the show with a two wire coil, this is what it's going to uh, look like for our pinouts and even for our three wire coils too if we're trying to gain access to wiring or anything like that. So we need to keep in mind how large these connectors are and if we can maybe get to a splice pack or closer to the coil oftentimes to uh, perform this testing as finding the correct wire can be kind of difficult to do at the PCM at times. For primary control, this is going to be how we're um, actually building up for the ignition event and what we're doing uh, to create the ignition event in the coil. So regardless of what module we're utilizing, if it's the PCM alone or if it's the PCM and the module on top of the coil, uh, we're going to have similar scenarios happening here. And what we're doing is we're turning on the control device and we're going to build up current in this coil. So if we were to take a lab scope with an amp clamp and actually visually look at the power feed to a coil or anything like that where we're actually able to watch this buildup in the coil, we will see a current ramp and this is building or we're actually having a dwell in the coil and this current continues to build until we utilize the control device to actually turn that off to then produce a spark event. So current through an inductor um, cannot change instantly because the current flow induces a voltage inside of the primary windings of the opposite polarity. This induced voltage is known as counter electromotive force or EMF as you may be familiar with. And it resists changes in current flow. Therefore, the current flow is going to ramp up and one of the following is gonna happen. The control device is going to turn off the current flow. The current is limited by the total resistance of the circuit, or we have current protection in the circuit. So you may see this if you're looking at a current ramp on your lab scope, where all of a sudden the ramp uh, changes as to how it was building. And this is oftentimes from the current limiting device uh, resistance or the module actually in control. Again, here's a look at that primary control and when the control device turns the coil off, now all of a sudden we've got a uh, decrease in current flow, a collapsing magnetic field, 
and it induces a positive voltage in the primary windings. Most control devices have components that limit this induced voltage to around 400 volts. Because of this high induced voltage, it is important to know if we're testing with a lab scope, we want to be aware of the capabilities of the lab scope as to how sensitive that range is. So if we take the lab scope, we can sometimes see the range on the scope and we may need to use uh, what we call an attenuator. We oftentimes will have a 10 to one attenuator or a 20 to one, and we need to know this ratio so we set up the scope properly and keep our scope safe. Let's dive into some of those wiring diagrams and get a little closer look at what this system looks like. So here we're gonna be working on a Ford three wire uh, coil design on this Ford Escape behind us. And we'll look at this wiring diagram to see what the layout of the system is. So we were mentioning before at the beginning of the class how we've got these ignition systems, ignition coils, modules, and we also mentioned crank and cam sensors though. So if we look at the crank and cam sensors, the reason why these are gonna be so important is these actually are a main uh, component as to an input for when a ignition event occurs. So here in this uh, wiring diagram, if we look, we have a battery positive feed from the fuse block. We also have a ground to every coil. Both of these items you'll see are in common to every coil as well. And then we have individual controls from the PCM. So these will be a different color wire for each coil. And that way we know that we're testing that control wire for the coil. And as well as these uh, wires that we're looking at here, the way that we get these inputs as to when the events will happen is going to be determined by the crankshaft position sensor and the camshaft position sensor. So in this scenario here, the PCM uses the crankshaft position sensor and it calculates a spark target. And then it fires the coil pack or the coil on plug, whatever layout we've got, um, to that target shown for the PCM. So this is all coming off of the crankshaft position sensor, and it's doing that by monitoring the waveform of the uh, reluctor on the crankshaft, and oftentimes we'll have two missing teeth or some type of a reference, and oftentimes Ford is using the missing teeth as a crankshaft reference. Uh, once we've determined that spark target, um, we've got that missing tooth, we've got the reluctor, the PCM is also going to utilize the camshaft position sensor. And it's doing this because it wants to identify the compression stroke on cylinder one. So to synchronize the firing of this coil and the other ones, uh, it uses the cam position sensor, and then we know where the compression stroke is of cylinder one. Now, if we move on to a different wiring diagram, here we've got a Honda three wire coil. So a similar layout, we've got three wires. Again, we can see we've got a battery positive feed to the coil. This is going to be in common with all of the coils. We also have a common ground. And so very similar to the other one. However, it is going to utilize different inputs on a Honda for the control of the coil. And this is where we want to look at like all data, Mitchell, something like that, or even factory service information to understand exactly where we're getting this control from and where the inputs are. So on this Honda here, it contains programming for basic ignition timing at various engine speeds and manifold absolute pressures. So it's looking at the map pressures, engine speeds, and calculating off of that. It's also going to adjust ignition timing according to the engine coolant temp. So it's going to vary this on how warm the engine is and also the intake air temperature. So if it's cold outside, we may have to change that uh, ignition timing a little bit. And these controls will all occur on that yellow wire in the diagram here. So this is going to be our control wire. The red wire and the gray wire are the power and ground feed to the coils. One other look at a three wire ignition coil would be this Toyota wire, uh, wiring diagram that we've got laid out here. So again, we've got the ECM, a power feed, and a ground. 
so far, very similar layout to both other designs where we've got common power feed and we've got a ground feed. Now our control is coming from the ECM again. However, in this scenario here, the control is going to operate on a zero to five volt command from the ECM. So if we're looking at this with a lab scope, sometimes we're gonna to wanna to change that range a little bit on the lab scope so that we're zoomed in enough to look at this and analyze the waveform properly. So this is why we wanna know what voltage ranges we're operating in, where previously, if we're looking at an ignition event, we're gonna be in the hundreds of volts and we need an attenuator. In this scenario here, we're actually looking at the control side and we're only operating on zero to five volts. So we want to actually uh, bring that voltage range down on the lab scope in order to view this accurately. Let's take a little closer look at this lab scope setup now on the vehicle and we'll actually get our hands on the vehicle, uh, set up the lab scope, apply these principles that we just showed um, on the wiring diagrams and actually set up. Our setup on this vehicle is going to be laid out as such on the screen here where we have the current clamp on the power feed. One thing you're gonna to notice too though is we've got a current clamp on the power feed which is common to all of the coils. This is going to give us what we call a parade pattern uh, as a lot of technicians may remember from the old sun scope or hunter scope or anything like that where we've got uh, you know, an old scope hooked up to the vehicle and we've got a parade uh, pattern and can watch all of our firing events. And we've also got a probe on the control wire from the PCM. So this is going to help us indicate what coil we're on. And if we know this as well, if we've got a firing order from service information, if we've got our sync for whatever coil we're hooked up to, we can now determine what coil may have a misfire or a, you know, a missing current ramp or anything like that. So with doing a parade pattern like this, if we're not even looking at an issue with the coil we're hooked up to, we can also determine a issue with another coil as well. Now that we've made our way on the vehicle and made some connections, let's take a little closer look at what we've actually got going on here as we've set it up per the wiring diagram. So here we've got our probe actually on the control wire. So this will be coming from the PCM. We're actually on coil number two here as it's a little easier to access. And so we've got uh, the hookup on this individual command wire. And then we've also got the current clamp for this coil uh, on the power feed for here. You may also see, if we take a look at how this current clamp is set up, it looks upside down right now. And the reason for that is when I was starting to take a capture to look at my settings, I noticed that the current ramp was actually going down in the capture. And this is something we're gonna to wanna to be aware of if we're doing some of our own lab scope work is to understand that that current ramp is going to build up. And so if that ramp is going down, we need to change the setup of this clamp in order to look at that waveform properly. So here we've got a current clamp on the power feed wire and we have a piercing probe on the uh, control wire from the PCM. You may also see that we've got our lab scope hooked up right here and we're on channels A and B. And we will also be looking at these uh, setups on the screen as we run the vehicle as well. So we're gonna start the engine now. And now with the engine running, we can analyze this waveform and we'll take a look at Channel A is going to be our current in the blue trace. We have a trigger set and it's a little bit below maximum in a clean spot of the waveform. And we also have a red trace on channel two and that's going to be the control wire from the PCM for this individual coil. So we can analyze these ignition events happening with this ignition coil here. So now hopefully we know a little bit more about this setup on the vehicle itself with hooking up a current clamp, a probe on the PCM control wire, and also analyzing the waveform on the lab scope itself. So now that we're done with the vehicle uh, diagnosis and looking at some of the ignition events, 
Hopefully you know a little bit more about diagnosing ignition systems and also cam and crank events and why these are so important to understand and why they're you know, needed parts and uh, good valuable inputs for the ignition system. So now we've covered things on the ignition components, how we're controlling these various components and modules in the case of some of the coils with a module in it, analyze some wiring diagrams, and we've also applied a lot of lab scope techniques to the wiring diagrams as well. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about ignition systems and cam and crank. All right, thanks Chris for that great information. Hopefully everybody now has a better understanding of different methods of diagnosing this. So a few key takeaways before we wrap it up here. Hopefully now you've all registered your name, your shop name, city and state of the shop, as well as a valid email address. Let's get entered into that drawing. We'd love to see some of you in person at our corporate training center. You can always go to NapaEcklin.com. And as you see on the screen here, you can click on the products tab and learn more about many of the different Napa Eklund family products here. You can also go to the Napa Eklund YouTube channel. And as you see here, there's a lot of great playlists, information about what's in your box, what type of product, the product development that goes into uh, the product in the box. But you can also click on latest videos. You're gonna see a bunch of installation tips, a lot of tech tips that came directly from our training team. So feel free to check that out. Also keep in mind for the shop owners on the call here today, if you're use, utilizing Napa ProLink system, take advantage of the Jumpstart promotions, make sure you're signed up. In August, we've got the ignition coil promotion, where if you buy $250 worth of Eklund ignition coils, you're gonna receive a $25 Visa gift card. And then coming up for the month of September, we got the promotion with the Eklund cam crank sensors. Similarly, if you're gonna buy $250 of them, then you get a $25 Visa gift card. Well, from all of us here at Napa Eklund, we appreciate you tuning in today. Appreciate uh, all the work you do there. Again, we come from the side of being technicians. We understand how important it is to have a good quality product because really your reputation rides on the quality of your work, the accuracy of the diagnosis, and certainly the quality of the product that you install in the vehicle. And so we appreciate your business. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Napa Eklund Education Time.